Um, before we get going this evening, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're indeed very grateful for this beautiful day that you've given us today and for all the blessings that we enjoy in our lives. We're thankful for this opportunity that we have to gather together this evening and open up your word and study from it. We know, Father, that uh, you've given us the scriptures and that they're profitable for us and there are many wonderful lessons that we can learn and apply to our lives. Father, we pray that everything that is said and done this evening will be pleasing to you in accordance with your word. Father, we pray for those of our number who are under the weather and unable to be here this evening. We pray your blessings be upon them, Father, as they recover. We pray, Father, for our country and the various problems that we're having now with the pandemic and then also with the civil unrest, Father. And we pray that those things might, might be worked out um, in a way that is pleasing and in accordance with your will. Father, we're so thankful for your son, Jesus, and for all that he's done for us. We're grateful for the example that he set for us to follow. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, we are in Joel chapter 2, as you remember, and we are talking about the, the great prophecy in Joel chapter 2, beginning of verse 28, that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, and we've talked about it a good bit. We have a few more things to say. Um, remember that the book of Joel, again, chapter one and beginning of chapter two dealt with a plague of locusts that was going to come through the land or perhaps already had come through the land and, and destroyed it, laid it waste. And that was a warning for the children of Israel. And Joel is trying to get them to repent and return to the Lord and, and follow him lest there be an army of men that come through and destroy them. And then we get down to Joel chapter 2, 28 to 32, and Joel moves on down the line in time, so to speak, and he gives this prophecy about the day of Pentecost. And as we've said, this is one of those prophecies we don't have to wonder about, we don't have to try to figure out, because we have an inspired apostle explaining it for us. So we're going to go ahead and just uh, read it again. And then uh, we'll finish up talking about uh, this. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Okay, so uh, we've talked a, a good bit about this. Uh, the pouring out of the Spirit obviously was fulfilled on the day, or at least it began to be fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the apostles. But we know that um, this prophecy talked about it being poured out on, on women as well. And, and so it's, it's not only a reference to the day of Pentecost, but how during this early Christian age, the apostles would lay hands on men or women and they would receive gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it's making reference to that. And, and we know that that was, that was for a purpose. It served a purpose. The church was um, in its infancy and the completed revealed will of God was not yet in written form. And, and they needed this miraculous uh, form of guidance to establish them and get them grounded and rooted in the truth. But the scriptures also um, foretold that there would come a time when those gifts would pass away. And, when, and that's that's a whole different study. But so that is uh, what is made reference to here. Now, if you read verses uh, 30 and 31, um, it says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Um, what is that a reference to? Well, it could be, could be two things, okay? This, this type of language, we call it apocryphal language, it is often used when 
an amazing and an incredible and earth-shaking event was going to occur. Uh, we see that type of language being used in the Old Testament. However, I think also, though, when you, when you think about it, the things that are mentioned here in this prophecy, they describe pretty well a lot of the events that took place when Jesus died on the cross. Um, it talks about wonders in heaven, wonders in the heavens and, and signs in the earth. Well, we remember, of course, that the sun was turned, into, turned to darkness uh, during this time. Signs in the earth. Well, what happened when Jesus was crucified? There was the earthquake. The tombs were open. Some of the dead were raised at that point and appeared to people. Um, so some of these signs occurred. And, and even when it talks about the moon being turned into blood, um, I didn't copy this word for word, but one of my commentaries I read quoted from a letter that Pilate wrote to Caesar and wherein Pilate was describing the crucifixion of Jesus. And he mentioned this time of darkness and he said that the moon appeared like blood at that time. It, was, it looked red. So even that could be um, what is being referenced here. So um, either way, I don't have a, any problem either way. Just it's apocryphal language mean and, and incredible events going to occur. And it could be referenced to the death of Christ, his resurrection, the day of Pentecost. That whole time frame there was a time that really changed the world and turn the world upside down, so to speak. Um, any questions on anything so far? Okay, well, our prophecy also says in verse 32 that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That idea of calling on the name of the Lord and, and what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? That phrase is used a lot throughout the scriptures, both Old Testament and New. If you look at the uses in the Old Testament, which I'm not going to go through each one and look at them, but in most cases, when it is used, it means either to go to God and worship, calling on the name of the Lord meant to worship him, to go to him in prayer, or to give thanks to God. Um, those are the three main usages of the word in, in the Old Testament. Now, but what does it mean as it's quoted here to call on the name of the Lord and being saved? Well, if calling on the name of the Lord leads to being saved, then can't we just look at passages in the scriptures in the New Testament that talk about being saved and how we're saved? And those things then would be must be what it means to call on the name of the Lord, because calling on the name of the Lord leads to salvation. So, I mean, you look at, for example, later in Acts chapter two, when Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there we have, again, repentance and baptism being mentioned as leading to the remission of sins. We know these people already believed. That was, um, that was the purpose of his sermon. They came to believe. And that led them to ask the question in verse 37, what shall we do? So Peter tells them, okay, now you need to repent and you need to be baptized for the remission of sins. So calling on the name of the Lord, it involves believing in Jesus, repenting of sins, uh, being baptized, we know, you know, passages on baptism, Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And we even have a passage we all know very well that refers to baptism and equates that with calling on the name of the Lord. Do you remember what verse that is? I know you probably know it. You might not know the reference, but it's Acts 22 and verse 16 when Ananias told Paul, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So in, in being baptized, he was calling on the name of the Lord. His sins were being washed away. So calling on the name of the Lord is a, a reference here in Joel to obedience to the commands of God, going to him for salvation and meeting his requirements for salvation. And when we suggest that we have to meet requirements, we are in no way suggesting that we are earning our salvation. 
or that God really owes us salvation. It's a gift. We realize that. But there are still requirements for me and you to have that salvation. Okay, so um, that is Joel chapter 2. Um, let's see. I'm trying to get back here. Oh, and then it just says there in uh, verse 32, in Mount Zion and Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among whom the rem among the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So again, it, it pinpoints Zion or Jerusalem, both reference to the city of Jerusalem as being the place where this would start, where this would occur. It would it would go forth from Jerusalem. And you remember we looked at Joel uh, Isaiah 2 last week as well that identified Jerusalem. So this is a very specific prophecy and um, it, it's really, I think, wonderful to see it fulfilled and explained so well to us. Wish all the prophecies in the Bible were so easy to see and understand. Any questions before we move into chapter three? Okay, Joel chapter three. I want to read the first 15 verses and then we're going to go back and comment on those verses. Joel 3, 1 to 15. For behold, in those days and at that time, I will bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage is my excuse me, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon and all the coasts of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me, Swiftly and speedily I will return your retaliation upon your own head, because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my prized possessions. Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks that you may remove them far from their borders. Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them and will return your retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. Well, as this chapter starts, it says, Behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. When you read about bringing back captives of Judah and Jerusalem, it's very tempting to think this, this passage applies to when Judah, when the Jews came back from captivity after the, the 70 year captivity, that's what you're tempted to think, but we need to remember the first words there of chapter three. In those days and at that time. In what days? Well, that goes back to the prophecy we just talked about in Joel chapter two, beginning of verse 28, the latter days. So this is something that was going to occur in those latter days. So this, this while it does make references to things that occurred in the Old Testament and in regard to the physical captivity of Israel, this actually is looking further down the road to a different captivity 
in a different return from captivity. Um, the bringing back of the captives then is something that took place after Pentecost. And what are we talking about then? Well, let's look at Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, because here is a, a prophecy about um, some captives being set free. Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So you notice there, that especially in the first couple of verses, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings. And then notice to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Now, I'm sure we all remember that Jesus reads this during his ministry, during his lifetime, and he applies it to himself. Look at Luke chapter four, verses 16 through 21. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus says this prophecy from Isaiah about the setting of the captives free and, and, and liberty for those who are oppressed that was a prophecy about him and the work that, that he was going to do. Now, in what way then does Jesus set the captives free? Well, we know that sin is, and the devil, it, it, the devil is our oppressor and Jesus sets us free from the devil and from the guilt of sin that we have committed. So uh, he makes our salvation possible. And so again, while it's very, tempting to want to apply this to the physical return of the Jews to Jerusalem. The greater picture here is, again, it's messianic and Jesus bringing uh, spiritual captives out of captivity, delivering us from sin. OK, and in some ways, the return of the Jews to Jerusalem was a foreshadow of that, if you will, um, in some ways as well. Questions or comments? All right. Um, our passage also talks about God gathering all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat to enter into judgment there. The name, you remember Jehoshaphat was one of the kings um, of Judah. Uh, it means Jehovah judges. That's the meaning of, of the name Jehoshaphat. There are people who, who try to make this a literal place and, you know, where is the Valley of Jehoshaphat located? And, and you know, I don't have a problem with that, but I, I don't think it has to be a literal place that um, Joel is referencing here. Um, God is simply telling us that there's going to come a time of judgment and he's going to judge the nations, all the nations, all the peoples who have, have persecuted his people. That's why he makes reference in the prophecy to, you know, you've sold my people into slavery and whatnot. And uh, the church has been persecuted throughout the ages, whether we're talking about the Old Testament church, which would be Israel, God's people, or 
the New Testament church, spiritual Israel, um, the church has been persecuted throughout the ages. And God is saying that he's going to bring those nations into judgment. Um, and it's almost like God is challenging them. You, know, you think you can you can stand up to me. You think you can fight me. Bring your weapons and, and we'll see. It's very similar to the imagery we have in the book of Revelation with the battle of Armageddon, right? The battle of Armageddon, again, people looking for a literal battle somewhere down the road between Jesus and, and the forces of the Antichrist, okay? But rather, what that really is, is a picture of the fact that at the end of time, God's going to destroy the wicked. He's going to bring judgment on the wicked. It's no battle that takes place Man can't fight against God, um, but it's a it's a picture of the final judgment of wicked mankind. So that's what we have here uh, at the beginning of, of Joel chapter three, a, a wonderful promise of captives being set free, reference to spiritual captivity and freedom in Christ. And um, Jesus even made reference to that in John chapter eight, when he says that we can know the truth and the truth will make us free. And then we have the picture of judgment in this valley of Jehoshaphat or Jehovah judges where God will judge the wicked. Any questions? Okay, we're going to finish out the book of Joel here, verses 16 through 21. Joel 3, 16 to 21. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens will shake, the heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy. No alien shall ever pass through her again. And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Acacias. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness because of violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall abide forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, whom I have not acquitted, for the Lord dwells in Zion. We are, as, as we read this, we're still talking about the judgment that God is going to bring upon, really, all of mankind at the end. He's going to bring destruction and judgment on the wicked, but this prophecy promises also that God will be a shelter for his people. Okay, he will bless us and provide for us. Um, talks about Jerusalem shall be holy, um, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, then Jerusalem shall be holy. I don't think this is a reference to physical Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, but rather I, I don't think Jerusalem as a city was ever really that holy, and it certainly isn't today. Um, I believe it's a reference to spiritual Zion, spiritual Jerusalem. We have uh, the prophet, not the prophecy, but we have the passage in Revelation 21 where John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, the first earth had passed away. There was no more sea Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the, the new Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem, which is a reference to the church here. And, and that the church is holy. Okay, and that is, I believe, what is being referenced here in Joel chapter three. Also in, the, in Joel chapter three, it talks about Jerusalem and that no aliens would ever pass through her again. Okay, um, meaning that this spiritual Jerusalem will never be plundered. It'll never be destroyed uh, or wiped from the face of the earth. Um, you think about physical Jerusalem, that city has gone back and forth throughout throughout the ages, uh, the Crusades and whatnot, and different people have ruled Jerusalem. There certainly have been foreigners in that city and even have conquered that city at different times, but not so with spiritual Jerusalem. Spiritual Jerusalem, the church, the kingdom of God is gonna last forever and no one will ever take it away from God. 
The prophecy in Joel 3 also mentions Egypt and Edom by name, that they're going to be a desolation. Again, some might say, well, if this is talking about, you know, the messianic age and the kingdom, why are specific nations like Egypt and Edom being referenced? Well, certain nations in prophecy represent certain things, okay? And Egypt and Edom were always enemies of God's people, okay? And so mentioning Egypt and Edom uh, and that they're going to be a desolation, that's simply saying that the enemies of God's people are going to be, again, a desolation. And this makes a reference to the final judgment. Judah and Jerusalem will abide forever. Again, that's referencing the spiritual kingdom of God. And then uh, verse 21 um, is a reference to the forgiveness that is available in God's kingdom. It says he won't hold, hold them guilty for their bloodshed. That, that's a reference to the forgiveness that is available in his kingdom. It is in no way suggesting, as some have taught through the ages, that um, the Jewish people, the physical Jewish nation, will be forgiven no matter what they do. They're all going to be saved. Um, that is not taught in the scriptures, but rather um, obedience and, and doing the will of God is, is necessary for salvation. Okay, any questions or comments over anything we've talked about today or anything in general in Joel? Okay, well, that finishes the book of Joel. And so I was thinking which one we should do next. And one of my favorite minor prophets is the prophet Amos. So we're going to go and uh, into the book of Amos now that we finish Joel. It also happens to come right after Joel, doesn't it? Hosea, Joel, Amos. And uh, we'll, we're going we're gonna to study Amos. As an introduction to the book, um, Amos is nine chapters. The author of the book of Amos, he tells us his name in chapter one and verse one. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Now, you remember when we studied Joel, we said we don't know hardly anything about Joel. We don't know when he wrote. It's all just sort of guesswork. Well, Amos is very specific here on telling us where he was from and when he wrote. So first of all, his name, the word Amos, it means to bear or to be burdened, to be a burden bearer. OK, and so Amos was a bearer of a burden. And that burden was he had to go and prophesy to Israel and um, warn them of the destruction that was coming up, going to come upon them. We don't know a ton about Amos, but he, had, he did tell us some things about him throughout the book. First of all, here in verse 1, he describes himself as being among the sheep breeders of, of Tekoa. So first of all, Tekoa. Uh, Tekoa was a small village 12 miles south of Jerusalem, 18 miles west of the Dead Sea. So if you have your Bible and you have a, a Bible map there, you, you find Jerusalem. Tekoa was 12 miles south, and then you have the Dead Sea down here below Jerusalem, and it was 18 miles west of the Dead Sea. Now, that area is not a very hospitable area, okay? Especially when you go toward the Dead Sea from, the, from Tekoa, because the farther you go to the Dead Sea, the, the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea for a reason, okay? It's very inhospitable and not conducive to life. And so uh, this, this land that he, he dwelled in as a herdsman was, was, it was sparse, it was uninviting. And so he would have been tough, okay? He, he had to be tough in order to live in those conditions. Um, in between Tekoa and the Dead Sea was the wilderness of Judea. The wilderness of Judea was where Jesus was tempted um, by the devil. And you might also remember it was where David fled from King Saul when Saul was pursuing him. Again, a very uninviting place, a lot of canyons, a lot of 
uh, hiding places. This same area really is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found um, in this area, very dry desert land. There were lions in the area, there were jackals, serpents. Um, and here he was a, a sheep herder, a sheep breeder among them. Now, from what I read, the word that is used here for a, a sheep breeder tells us that the kind of sheep that he, um, that he bred, I don't know how to pronounce, it sounds like naked, but it's nakad, N-A-K-A-D, sheep. And these were supposed to be very small, uh, sheep that had um, their wool was of superior quality and of greater value than normal wool. So he was a, a, sh a shepherd in this inhospitable land. So he, he was an outdoorsman. He would have to be an outdoorsman to, to be able to do that in those conditions. But he also describes himself um, in chapter 7 and verse 14 and he says, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. So he also was a tender of sycamore fruit. Now, the sycamore trees were told, or they, they don't exist in Tekoa, where Tekoa was. The elevation was too high. But these trees existed at a lower altitude. That tells us that he must have... Um, spent time over toward the Dead Sea because the elevation goes down toward the Dead Sea. Again, this, this land was sparse. The fruit from the sycamore trees is said to be fig-like, fig-like, and it's supposed to be sweet and watery and um, slightly sweet and watery and had to be pinched or bruised before it would ripen. I, that's what I've read about that. And also, it wasn't really considered a, a delicacy. It was a, a fruit that was eaten by the poor um, more than the wealthy. So um, that was another thing he did. He was a, send, a tender of the sycamore fruit. Okay. Questions or comments so far? Okay. As to the date of the writing, he mentions two kings. He mentions who the king of Israel was and who the king of Judah was. Uzzah was the king of Judah and Jeroboam. That would have been Jeroboam II. There was more than one Jeroboam who was king over Israel. This would have been the second Jeroboam. Both of those kings reigned from about 790 to about 740, 745 B.C. Okay, so his prophet, his his work as a prophet took place during that time period, 790 to 740. Um, most put it toward the end of that time period, maybe around 750, 755. Um, so if we say 755 BC, that then tells us that his work in Israel and the 10 northern tribes took place really in the last couple decades that Israel was a nation because Israel was taken by the Assyrians in 721. So we're at 755. Within about 30 years, Israel was going to be conquered by the Assyrians. So this is sort of God's final push to try to get them to repent. Amos also mentions an earthquake that doesn't really help us very much. There were many earthquakes, uh, still are many earthquakes in that region um, as a result of the geography. So that doesn't really help us to narrow it down. But just from the kings, we can narrow it down to a 50-year a period. Okay, we're not done with the introduction, but the bell is rung. So we're going to go ahead and, and stop there for tonight. We will continue and finish the introduction and get into chapter 1. Uh, next week. Anybody have any questions before we do our announcements tonight? Okay. Um, first of all, in terms of announcements, I'll give a few that I know about. Um, I know John isn't here tonight. He sent a text uh, saying that he's not feeling well. So keep Brother John in your prayers. And also, Donella mentioned Eddie isn't feeling well tonight. So keep Eddie in your prayers as well. 
Um, are there any other updates or new prayer requests? Bobby? My co-worker Joe, when I mentioned last week, that had back surgery. It went well for him. He's very, very sore, but he's home recovering, and he says every day it's just a little bit better, so hopefully he's going in the right direction. Okay, so Bobby's co-worker Joe had his back surgery, went well, and, and he's recovering. We, we're glad to hear that. Glad to see Bruce back with us. He was sick for a little while, and uh, we're glad that he's with us. Any other prayer requests? Okay, any other announcements that need to be made at this time? There's just not a lot going on, is there? No. Okay, well, uh, we're going to go ahead then and conclude with a word of prayer. Um, Bobby, would you be willing to, to word that prayer? Our most gracious and loving Father in heaven, we are truly thankful for the opportunity we had this evening to come together with our brothers and sisters and open your word and study it and learn more about how you would have us to live. Father, we're so very thankful for it. The Bible that we have your written word and instructs us how we are conduct ourselves as Christians. The Father, more importantly, to show us the steps of salvation that we can ultimately be with you in heaven someday. Father, we're thankful for Jesus, the great sacrifice that He made that day on the cross that makes that possibility happen for us. Father, we ask that you please be with our brother John as he is dealing with some health problems. We just pray things will go well for him. Father, we ask that you please be with my co-worker Joe as he continues to improve. We just thankful for the answered prayers on his behalf and pray that he continues. Father, we ask you be with all those that are in California and dealing with the wildfires on the West Coast right now. Father, we just pray that you'll be able to help them in any way that you can. Father, we ask that as we depart here this evening that you watch over us and keep us safe through the rest of the week. Father, we just pray that you help us to overcome the sin that we have in our lives and help us to strive to do better in the future. All these favors and blessings we ask in Jesus' dear name. Amen.